Turn to Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read this text in just a moment. I want to introduce it first to us. Two guys were out hunting for deer on a cold, snowy day. Suddenly, they heard a crackling through the trees and a huge sow bear came rushing toward them. They both took off running as fast as they could, but their heavy winter coats and their boots made their movements clunky. They knew that the bear would soon catch them. One of the hunters had a brilliant idea. He stopped, knelt in the snow, and grabbing a pair of dry sneakers out of his backpack, began to replace his wet boots. His comrade looked back and shouted at him, What are you doing? Putting on sneakers will not help you outrun a bear. The man looked up at his incredulous companion and calmly replied, I don't have to outrun the bear. I only have to outrun you. Let that pause for effect there. <laughs> People are competitors by nature. And our desire for self-preservation and personal victory often leads to comparisons, even manipulations, dishonesty. Living for what we can get for ourselves. Hoping to get positions of prestige. Viewing others as a point of opponents, competitive spirits, complaints about others' privilege, accusations of injustice. Just another day in the first church. So Jesus tells a story to these ragtag disciples, these first church members, to remind them that God's goodness, generosity, and sovereign grace should lead brothers and sisters to value one another in light of that grace and mercy, rather than in light of position, preeminence. This story is found in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. Let's read that story. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. <clears throat> and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. When those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These men, these last men, have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give it to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called but few chosen. There's a textual variant in that last, for many are called, few chosen. It's found again later in Matthew. We're going to deal with that phrase at another time. Let's pray. Lord, help us to hear this parable. Open our minds to understanding it. Help us not to have assumptions about what it means without diving deep into the context and the words used. Lord, I believe we will be greatly convicted through the understanding of this parable and challenged. And this is good. 
please do that work in us by your Spirit's power. In Jesus' name, amen. This parable is actually one of my most favorite that Jesus tells. Matthew is the only evangelist who records it for us. Luke, Mark, and John don't have this anywhere in their writings. This morning, we're going to work through the context of the parable, which I believe in this parable is perhaps the most important part in understanding the correct interpretation is the context. Understanding why Jesus tells the parable at this time and why it's recorded right here for us. We're going to also notice the flow of the parable, kind of what happens in the story, and hopefully see the main point through both the context and the flow. And then, as is important to do with all parables, we need to adapt the parable to our hearts and minds. How are we going to apply this? What's this going to mean for us? And I believe that God's holy word in his spirit will admonish and encourage us both by the nature of God and our responsibility as his church, his disciples in this parable. This parable is one of those that frankly... Most people have um, assumptions or ideas already solidified in their mind of what the main point is. And I would just ask you, um, humbly, to suspend those this morning. Maybe it's correct. I don't know what your view, view on this interpret interpretation of this parable is. I just ask you to suspend that. And go through me on the journey of understanding it through the context. Um, perhaps you might see that it's a little different than maybe thought originally. That happened to me as I studied this week, this parable. The story's context is perhaps the most important part about this parable. If you back up two chapters, you'll notice we have a problem with the disciples. Well, might I might put it this way, the disciples have a problem. They're, they're having some issues with pride and humility, and they're coming to Jesus asking him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Comparison, com competition among Christ followers. So Jesus puts a little child in the midst of them and says, unless you are converted, that's change your proud hearts, and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not done because then in verses 6 through 9, he essentially suggests that competitive and complaining hearts <coughs> against one another is the equivalent of spiritual child abuse as children of God. And then he tells them, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, one another. Then he commands them about dealing with a sinning brother against you. And then he tells Peter and the others a story, a parable again, about an unforgiving person. You can see the whole context there is debate and competition and fighting and comparisons and, and, and who's the greatest and Jesus and, and sinning and forgiveness. And Jesus is speaking of interpersonal relationships and they're really their, their terrible approach to it. Their arrogant approach to interpersonal relationships. In Matthew 19, the next chapter, finds Jesus and his disciples interacting now with the Pharisees and the rich young ruler in Judea as they make their way back to Jerusalem where he will die and rise again for their life. The disciples are still in the mode of greatness comes by looking at great people. So they are shocked when Jesus suggests that this rich young man is not great. In fact, he's lacking something. And they think, well, what's, how could anyone be saved if the greatest of us cannot be? See, they've still got their minds centered on greatness. On greatness, being great being powerful, being rich, being something. And for them, leaving all to follow, to be something, at least in the kingdom of God, maybe they're not pursuing being something in the world, but they're pursuing being something, being somebody. A little more than John, a little more than Andrew, being somebody amongst this tiny band of followers. He rebukes the disciples in that chapter. And once again, uses the example of lowly children, the children that they are rejecting. He says, no, bring children to me because you have to be like a child. You have to be like a child. Don't forget that. See, Jesus is building among them a messianic community of love and service. But as we know as being true and we're honest with ourselves, being a little better than another, having dominance over others has such an attractive sense to it. This attitude must still be present in the disciples because shortly after telling this parable, we're looking at today, James and John's mom then comes. I mean, this is right after the parable. James and John's mom comes and 
And all they're thinking about, he's just told a parable and he's, he's been teaching about children and being like children, but all they can think about, and perhaps they even instigated their mother to do this after hearing all these things. I mean, I don't want to go ask him, you, I'll send mom. You know, surely he won't say no to her. And one little phrase stood out to them. Thrones. Thrones. We're going to have thrones. But that's not enough. Well, who's going to be on the right and who's going to be on the left? The places of power and prominence. Who's going to have the most glory? Mom asks them, well, I just have, she kneels down, I just have one simple request. In your kingdom, make sure my two boys sit on the right and left. I want the best for my boys. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. And then he tries to show them that greatness is not found in what you can do and accomplish and how, how much ability you have and, and whether you have the position of, of, of this side or that side, you're on the right and left. Greatness comes when you serve with love. And then finally, he'll even demonstrate it because the very next chapter, he then enters Jerusalem, not praising himself, children praising him. He enters Jerusalem riding, the Bible says, meek and lowly, on the colt of a donkey. You see how the context here is all one main thing going on. Matthew is revealing to us that the disciples are having a problem that every one of us has and let us not kid ourselves into thinking we don't. Pride is an ugly sin. Self-interest, competition, and, and, and seeking to be better than another is, and, and viewing ourselves as morally or physically or intellectually superior to others. And thus we deserve more recognition. We deserve more pay. We deserve something more. Is as common as it is in all of humanity in each one of us in the church. You don't believe me? Do you think it's only in the world? Well, it was in these 12 the first church, the ones who were the foundation of the church, surely it's in that which came from the foundation. Surely it's a problem that we struggle with. I have been impacted more and more and more as I've been studying this section in Matthew at how much Jesus right before his death, which is quite frankly the most humiliating thing that can happen to him, great humbling, Right before his death, how intent he is to teach his messianic community, his fledgling church, the importance, if not the only significant character quality needed in the church. And that is a great sense of humility, of lowliness. It's not so much that the disciples are more proud than other people. It's simply that Jesus is intent to keep bringing it to their attention over and over and over again because he wants to change them. This context seems to quite repetitively emphasize that the disciples are struggling to understand that the grace and mercy of God is all that matters eternally in Christ and that all their efforts to jockey for position, power and prestige and preeminence are vain exercises. It is very important. I think this is a very important part of understanding this parable correctly and interpreting it right. It is also important to understand that it, that it is these discontented disciples discontented disciples, envious of one another, to whom Jesus tells the parable. Did you notice that? This is for his disciples. This is not in front of the Pharisees. This is not for all the crowds. This is not him teaching some truths about Jews and Gentiles. He's talking to his disciples alone. Thus, they are the objects he's directing, directing it to. Therefore, I believe that in the context, it would become very clear that Jesus intends for the disciples to see themselves as these servants. Yes, not just the 11th hour servants, but to see themselves as the first servants. In fact, they are the first, are they not? I think the disciples would have to really be ignoring it not to see themselves in this story. You see how the context of Jesus is telling this story is beginning to give us a clue as to what the main point of the parable is. The context in the audience thus is com complaining and competing followers of Jesus, intent on laboring for their rights and laboring for what they're due, for what they shall receive, as Peter asked. What shall we receive? What recognition will we have for our work? So Jesus tells them a story about some people who worked. 
And he starts it as he often does, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now parables are not always true to life stories. I mean, they're usually true to life generally speaking, but they often involve unreasonable or surprising twists. And that's important in a parable. It's supposed to be surprising. It's supposed to have unreasonable elements often. Sometimes there are different purposes in parables, but, but often it's supposed to have an unreasonable or surprising element. It's supposed to not make sense on one level. Because the point of it not making sense is as you read it, you say, wait, that doesn't make sense. What, what are you trying to say with this? And it's to spark the thinking as to, well, why doesn't it make sense? Perhaps you don't make sense. Perhaps that's why it doesn't make sense. Perhaps what you're doing is wrong. That's the point of a parable. And this is one of those like that. So in working through this parable, I would encourage you to take note of the strange details because those strange details or those plot twists, that's what's going to clue us in on what the point of the parable is. Because that's the difference. That's the part that's like, that doesn't quite make sense. Jesus' story, however, does start out quite normal. He starts a lot of parables this way. The kingdom of heaven is like. Essentially, he is saying, when you think about disciples, Peter, John, Andrew, Thomas, when you think about the kingdom of God or heaven, and you think about relationships of the people in the kingdom and work and laboring in my kingdom, let this story challenge you. Let this story come into your mind as well. And then there is nothing too surprising as he tells the parable in the opening. Right? A landowner who owns a vineyard goes early in the morning. Jewish accounting, this is probably 6 a.m. <coughs> he goes out to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. We find that he goes out five times throughout the day to the marketplace to hire laborers. That's not unusual. The marketplace was where most day laborers waited uh, for those to come to hire them, making themselves available for hiring for the day. The fact that he needs so many day laborers in, long, in the long hours, the 11th hour is the last hour. I mean, that's, that's a long day. Um, would make sense during the harvest season of the grapes. And most likely, this is the harvest. And harvesting in a vineyard was hard work. And it was not uncommon to hire day laborers to do this job since many of slaves and full-time laborers had other responsibilities already. Now understand, being a day laborer was a difficult life. The average salary was a denarius a day. Exactly what the parable shows being paid. Or showing Jesus is telling a normal story here. The average salary is about a denarius a day. Uh, making a denarius a day was not really livable wage in Judea. It was below poverty to make that kind of wage. Being a day laborer was perhaps the most oppressive form of service, the lowest class. Slaves were in a higher class than day laborers because slaves actually were considered in that culture, were considered part of the family, and they had many privileges as being slaves. Day laborers basically were, were seeking whatever they can do every day to survive. That was it. You didn't get wealthy as a day laborer. So it is instructive that as the disciples are hearing this, and he's talking about laboring in his kingdom, that he tells a story about the lowest class. He tells a story wanting them to see themselves in the lowest class as day laborers. Furthermore, we find out that day laborers, during the harvest season, would probably have found ready work. And yet there are some who even with one hour left in the day, in daylight, are still hoping someone will hire them. They must have been the most desperate of all. We ought not make much out of the fact that they were standing there. We read that, right? They're standing there idle. Some have made a big deal out of that and they thought this parable is all about hard work. Don't be idle. You know, these that were idle. But even if you're idle, don't worry. You, you'll make some money. It's like thinking, well, how can people read this and come up with this stuff? It's, it basically, the idea, the, the word idle there has no moral connotation to it in the original language. It, it simply means they just didn't have a job. <laughs> they weren't working. This, this parable is not about how to get a job and re, a rebuke of indolence or laziness. So the landowner, though, strikes a normal agreement with the first laborers for a denarius a day around 6 in the morning. Around 9, he goes back to the marketplace to get some more laborers and hires them on the basis, he says, of what is fair, what is right. He goes out about noon, 6th hour, and then 3, the ninth hour, and hires more laborers. 
It's a little strange that he doesn't hire them all at once. We do find they've been standing in the marketplace all day long. That's what the one last one said. They've been there all day. So it's not that they just came later. They were there all the time. But he's just, the whole point of this is not some deeper meaning. It's just Jesus telling a good story. It makes the story more sense. You catch, you follow along with it. He's paying them a relatively low wage, denarius a day. So this really isn't about the over-generosity even of the, of the landowner. It's not really about that. He's not being generous and giving, oh, wow, so much money for this little bit of labor. It's a normal wage that he's giving because that's not one of the details that matters spiritually. It's simply to make the story make sense and move the parable along until the main point of the story comes along. And that comes into view as we get toward the end, or the middle of the parable, but the end of the day. The eleventh hour. Now this is one of the, this is first surprising twist, okay? This is first surprising twist that gets our attention in thinking through the parable. And that is this. Why, why does he wait the eleventh hour? Um, what could he get out of one hour of work? There's usually 12, hour, 12 hours of a work day. That includes um, breaks and things. It is usually a 10 hour work day in that time. But I believe that's just simply because he wants, Jesus wants us to see just how insignificant they were. They didn't benefit him that much. Worked an hour in the day. We cannot help but see that the story is getting to the point that Jesus is going to make with his disciples, though. Most of the parable turns upon the comparison of those hired at the first, right, and those hired at the last, which, if you noticed in your Bibles, is interesting because there is an inclusio. 9.30 says, but many who are first will be last, and the last first, and then Jesus tells the story, and then at the very end, verse 16, so the last will be first and the first last. He kind of reverses the order. It's inclusio. It's little brackets in which this parable is being told. First and last is what he's talking about here. So this is the main point of the story. So it makes sense then he talks about those who were hired first and those who were hired last. And then the uniqueness, he calls his steward and says that's the, that's the manager and he says now pay them but I want you to start with the last and then pay the first. Now there is no um, cultural reason for this. There is nothing, this is, this is strange, this is unique. In fact, this is, this is not normal. It seems to be the only reason that Jesus would be telling the story this way is because he wants to pit this contrast between the first and the last. As I said, there's all kinds of, when you get into parables, all kinds of weird interpretations abound. One interpretation I read suggested that this story isn't at all good. It's not even about God or Jesus or disciples. It's, it's about how greedy landowners can be and how they want to be cruel to those by paying them and showing and, and you know, like parading before them, paying only the last guy, but then making a mockery of the first. And I'm thinking, no, it's not about that either, <laughs> Right? This first and last is important, though, in the parable. The reason that the first is waiting, Jesus pays, has, has the landowner paying the last first, is to set up the moral of the story. It's to set it up. It's his story, and he wants to tell it this way. If it's the purpose he is telling in the story. We find that since he pays the last who worked only an hour, the same that he promised to pay those who worked all day, ten hours plus, <clears throat> those who, now, who worked longer now assume that they have become worth more. They assume they become worth more. Not on the basis of anything except what he has paid the last, right? They didn't even think about it until they saw the last getting paid more. It didn't even occur to them that they might be worth more until they saw how much these others were getting. And when he gives them the same denarius that they agreed to, they are very upset. It says they complain against the landowner. Oh, they're angry. They've got a, 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 they've got a lifted up valuation of themselves based upon what they saw others getting. These last have worked only one hour. And notice this phrase. This shows us their mindset. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. You notice what their problem is? Their problem's not that, hey, that's an unfair wage. Their problem's that, wait, you've made them equal to us. You're in essence saying they're as valuable as we are. And we just don't think that's fair or right. We have done so much more. We deserve more. Do you hear echoes of the disciples here? 
what will be for us? What will be for us? We've left all and followed you. They didn't think the wages were unfair. It was not that they believed they were being ripped off because of the work they were doing. The only reason they now felt like complaining against the landowner was because they saw how well others who they imputed as inferior were being treated by the landowner. As I mentioned before, day laborers were the lowest of the social class, lower than slaves. And these 11th hour day laborers couldn't even get work during the busy harvest until the last hour. They're the losers. It is likely that those day laborers first hired seemed to have some high notions of their value and were content to look down on those who were of the same class expecting to be paid more than them. I mean, had they not witnessed this, they would have even been different, right? Had they gotten paid first and left, they would have never known and they would have not complained. They'd have been happy for their denarius. It all turns and hinges on they see another being exalted and that bothers them. That's what it all hinges on. They see the goodness in someone else and they don't like that. It's not fair. How can they get this and I get the same? I deserve more. I've worked more. I've born more. The heat of the day has weighed been upon me. I deserve more. When they begin to look at the grace and mercy being bestowed upon those unworthy of it, their eye becomes evil. That's an Old Testament um, idiom that means envious, jealous. And their jealousy causes them to complain against the Lord of the land. The landowner responds with some very potent words that surely were not missed on the disciples who by now had to have seen themselves in the story as the first laborers in God's vineyard. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? What's the point of all of this? Jesus adds an explanation to the disciples who were struggling to understand what he had been saying with the last and first inclusio. So the point Jesus is making is to admonish the disciples who'd become so focused on becoming first in the kingdom to consider themselves last, to humble themselves as servants. And this parable works to convict them of their own tendency toward an evil eye toward God and one another in the Messianic kingdom. Something we've seen going on all through the context, right? An evil eye toward one another. Because they're in a kingdom where they have been called to serve, not to be served. Now a few really try, I'm going to go through a few explanations that are put out there of this parable. A few really try to stretch the parable into allegory. And you know me, I've preached through a lot of parables here. You know that I run from allegory pretty quickly. And rightfully so, I believe. And they've even come up with the five hirings or five periods of history from Adam to the present. Or five stages of life experience. Or the denarius is symbolic of eternal life and the evening is judgment. But allegorizing this parable is not wise. You see, when Jesus gives parables to his disciples, especially when his disciples are alone, he never uses allegory. They're meant to understand it. The disciples were meant to receive it. This is an illustrative story meant to get a point across to the disciples. A few try to adapt this parable to cry out, as I mentioned, against social problems, bad employers, unfair wages, disunity in work. But I believe these are clearly reading back into the text social issues. It's not anywhere in the context. Jesus is talking to the disciples about the messianic community, the kingdom of heaven, not about cultural employment practices. More think that Jesus is teaching about the Gentiles who will come into the kingdom of heaven after the Jews and warning them about jealousy about those Gentiles who will come later. Later. 
And then the Gentiles will become first above the Jews, as Paul describes that idea. Now, theologically, there, there's some sense in that, right? Um, we recognize that in Romans, the idea that God then has humbled the Jewish nation and has exalted the Gentiles to make now the, the Gentile church be the main um, people of God, the people of God. So there is some theological truth to that interpretation, but nowhere in the context is there any Jew-Gentile conflict or controversy. There's no Gentiles found anywhere in this issue. In fact, he's deep in Jeru J Judea territory. He's not even around Gentiles. And when Jesus seeks to make that Jew-Gentile point, he'll do so often in the scripture in Gentile region or with Gentiles present. He doesn't hear. The more popular interpretation is that Jesus is talking about salvation being by grace alone. And that equal spiritual reward is guaranteed to all who believe, regardless of when they come to faith. And I've heard this parable explained this way. It doesn't matter if you were saved in the 11th hour, and you know, the, your deathbed, or you're saved early on as a child. In the end, we all have eternal life. Um, there's some truth to that, right? I'm, I'm not denying that these are true statements. Uh, there's one little tweak, though. Yes, we all have eternal life, but to say that this is teaching equality of reward would miss all the rest of the Scripture that teaches the concept of inequality of reward. Right? Uh, Paul's whole argument in Corinthians is that at the judgment seat of Christ, and the Bema seat of Christ, there will be different rewards. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. Some will suffer loss and have nothing. Some will have... So the Bible teaches that there is actually variety of reward in heaven. Not all equal reward. So I don't think this parable is teaching there's equal reward. Also, people say, well, it's by grace alone. It's, you know, salvation is by grace alone, which is true. But in this parable, they're working for their denarius. So if the denarius is symbolizing eternal life and we're to take that interpretation, do you see where that might get us in a theological mess? Those who labor, we have to labor for it, but we all get it. No, it's, it's not what it's about. It's not about eternal life. It's not about when you enter the kingdom. It's not about whether, when you believe, whether you're old or young. If we were the disciples and we heard this parable, it would be impossible not to see ourselves as the laborers in God's vineyard. The vineyard was often symbolic of Israel, right? God's people. They viewed themselves as his vineyard. So it would make plain sense as there is no one else around and it being clear that this story was for them that they are God's workers, his followers. They have already been promised to be the church, the Messianic community. But are the disciples the first or the last workers? In the context, they probably would see themselves as the first workers. They were those whom God had chosen first. And we also know they had a strong tendency to want to be first, didn't they? It's not the first and only time Jesus says, reminds the disciples, the first will be last, the last will be first. It's not the first and only time they compete and seek to be the greatest. Remember how they started the context, chapter 18? Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? We've got some thrones. I want to sit on the right and the left. I want to be the greatest. I believe that these disciples are the first workers. And they are tending to look down upon one another with an evil, evil eye because they want what they believe to be fair, what Peter just said in the context. We have left all and followed you. What then will be ours? I mean, James and John have been following for such a long time. Should they not? I mean, is it not fair? Is it not right that James and John, I mean, they left their nets. They left their lucrative father's business of fishing. They were there from the beginning. They were John's disciples. Should it not be right that they above the others should sit on the right and left-hand side? of their brothers, they would know how to rule so well together. And Peter, I mean, hasn't Peter... Been, been there in the midst of it all and hasn't he already been promised as the rock to be the foundation that God would build his church upon? And, and hasn't Peter also been the one who first confessed Christ? 
I mean, shouldn't he have a little bit extra? Shouldn't he have some recognition? Shouldn't he have something? I mean, I've worked so hard and so long, and we have left all. We have borne the heat of the day and the burden of the day. Shouldn't we get a little compensation? Shouldn't we get a little something commensurate with how hard we have been working for you, Jesus? I mean, can't you see the disciples here? To the first audience, it was a clear proclamation that God, who is the first and best of beings, is alone sovereign, good, and merciful. It's His kingdom. So why are they so intent on being first? Why were they who are day laborers so interested in besting one another, in getting a greater reward? In having glory, recognition, honor, preeminence. I mean, it's just nice that people be recognize you sometimes. The point of this parable is indeed the rebuke to the Christ followers who had again gotten wrapped up in their own self-importance that they have forgotten who the story is really all about. Jesus has now told them multiple times and he's going to tell them one more time that he has come and he has come to die for their sins and he has come to rise again and he will justify them and he has explained to them how he'll be captured and taken by the chief priests and the scribes and the soldiers will crucify him and he's going to tell them one more time and he's on at the gates of Jerusalem. He's on the outskirts. He's ready to end his greatest task. He's ready to begin this new covenant and they're thinking, no, who, I'm first in line. No, I'm first in line. No, it's me. Do you see why Jesus tells this parable? Do you not understand that the point is Jesus? The point is his cross. The point is the gospel. And these disciples have done a fantastic job of making the point about them. Do you see the disciples in this parable? But a greater question, my brothers and sisters, do you see yourself in this parable? The story's about Jesus. The covenant's about Christ. The gospel is chief. But they took my chair. They took my spot. But I was supposed to sing that song. How come I was left? How? It's, the, it's not about us. It's not about our, our preeminence. It's not about our recognition. It's not about whether we're honored or dishonored. It's not about whether we receive what we want or don't receive what we want. It's about the exaltation of Jesus Christ. It's about the cross of Christ. It's about the glory of God. And these disciples have just done a great job of making it about their glory. And I fear that we are not much different. We so easily make it about our glory and we so easily complain against the landowner let's adapt this story to our lives maybe we shouldn't it might be too painful and do we ever replace the pursuit of power preeminence glory recognition or winning above the hearts and souls of those within God's vineyard three simple truths stand out to me in adapting this parable to my life, for my spiritual well-being and for the spiritual well-being of God's church. And I encourage you to follow with me in a thinking through these, spiritual, these three truths from this parable and adapting it to our living and thinking. And the first thing I notice in this parable is that Jesus is teaching the truth that in all things, God alone is sovereign. God alone is sovereign. It is clear that Christ is making a distinction between the laborers who complain against the landowner, the vineyard's owner. Notice these statements made. I wish to give this last man the same as you. Isn't that a powerful statement? I wish. I desire. Whose desire is being considered in this parable? Peter's desire was we've left all, what shall we have? James and John's desires, I want to sit on the left and right. Jesus is pointing out through this parable, the landowner's desire is what matters. I desire. We read in Ephesians chapter 1, 
about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And we also read that those blessings are because, as it says in the scriptures, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And again, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. And again, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Notice this other statement here. The, the landowner who I believe clearly represents God says, I wish to give to the last man the same as you also says this. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Notice the thread of sovereign authority Jesus is teaching his disciples. It is the landowner's vines, the landowner's denarius, the landowner's work, the landowner's prerogative. How dare the thing formed say to the one who formed it, why have you made me this way? Has not God who is the potter power over the clay to make a lump for honor and a lump for dishonor? See, God is sovereign in all things over his vineyard. Is it not lawful for him to give what is his to give and only his alone? I mentioned this earlier. We learned the catechism. Who is the first and best of beings? God is the first and best of beings. So then why all the fuss about trying to be first and best? There already is a first. And it isn't me, and it isn't you. The first is God. We are really last. And the humble one who comes down from heaven's glory, sovereign, bame, and a manger, he appears to be last while on this earth. But he is really, truly first and true sovereign God. God is sovereign in all things. Number two, God is merciful and good. He's merciful and good. I believe these two truths are what our knowledge of God hinges upon. That God is great, that he is sovereign, and that God is good. That God is great and that God is good. We might think that the landowner was not very good in the parable. The denarius a day isn't extravagant. He didn't overpay them. He was fair, but he was merciful. Notice these words. Is your eye evil because I am good? It was the goodness of the Lord to those who least deserved it that irked the hard workers. And it is true today as well. How often are we willing? Examine yourselves, brothers and sisters. How often are we willing to weep with those who weep, but unwilling to rejoice with those who rejoice? I mean, it's easy to weep with those who weep. Tears beget tears. It's easy to mourn with somebody when they're in mourning. But, but do you rejoice when they benefit from God's goodness and you appear not to? I mean, you've been struggling to make friends in a new place, but a brother or sister seems to have people flocking around them do you rejoice that they have friends or grumble against the master for the goodness he has given them? You don't get the job and a brother who has plenty of money, he gets a raise. Is your eye evil because God has been good to your brother? Perhaps you feel you have worked a long time in the church. You have, you sacrifice, you clean the building, you teach and no one seems to notice. But then a new person, that new member, everyone seems to be talking about. It's just not fair. But can you not rejoice in God's goodness and mercy to a brother, a sister? Or must, or must the cause for rejoicing in God's goodness only be when we are the recipients of that goodness? See, we love the concept of mercy. We love the concept of grace. We love the concept of goodness so long as it's being administered to us. And we love the concept of justice so long as we're administering it to someone else. 
We learn that God is good in this text. But be careful, my dear friends, that we do not assume that God is only good when that goodness, that mercy extends to me. Be careful that we do not receive an evil eye because of the goodness of God in someone else. And the third truth, <laughs> thus we ought to be humbled. God is sovereign. God is good. We are not. I would suggest that considering that God alone is sovereign and God is truly good, ought we not learn the lesson that Jesus has been teaching his disciples over and over again? Be last. Be little. Be lowly. Be nothing. Embrace your insignificance in this world because you have a significant God. Embrace your mediocrity, your lack of ability, because you have an all-powerful God. I've said it before. Others have said it as well. It still rings true. You and I don't need to pursue awesomeness because we have a God who is absolutely awesome, inspiring awe. Be humbled. Be little children. Minister to the meek and the lowly. Condescend to men of low estate. Let this mind be in you like it was in Christ, who, though he being equal with God, did not think it something that he had to grab onto, hold onto. Instead, he humbled himself, he lowered himself, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of of a servant. Fashion is a man. And he became obedient, humbled himself all the way to the cross. And yet we ask, but what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? Who is the greatest? Focused on self-interest, individualism, complaining against the master and one another, disunity and discord. They have afflicted the first 12 and they've afflicted the church ever since. And the key, the key is not just say, well, I'm going to try to be more humble. The key is to see God alone as sovereign and good. That's the key. Focus on God who is sovereign and good and you will be naturally humbled underneath that. Let us make it our prayer. Put a hand over our lips if we cannot pray this honestly. As in the words of Charles Simeon, let us be zealous to grow downward in humility. Be zealous to grow downward. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus will teach them this lesson again before the cross as he will enter Jerusalem in this final week. He will enter meek and lowly, riding on the colt of a donkey. Others will praise him, simple children, he will take no glory on himself for he will, be, he will be writing to embrace our shameful pride upon his humble shoulders. And as God though, nailing that ego and pride of ours and competitiveness to the cross, Jesus is heading to his finest hour. Sadly, the disciples are heading toward their darkest. But they will learn humility Praise God, they will learn humility. By God's grace, He will not leave them alone. By God's grace, He will not leave them. He continues to teach them. He looks at them. He calls them. He visits them after His resurrection in their unbelief. He sends them. He enables them. And the God who will not let them stay proud is the God who will not let us stay proud. We have a good and sovereign God who teaches us in parables and teaches us through experiences and teaches us through so many ways that He alone is God and we are not. Let's pray.